John chapter 17. Again, we're in the midst of um, a long series of messages that have the theme, the kingdom of God, and we're in a phase of it, I don't know how, how to call it, where we're talking about things to come. Okay? John chapter 17 in verse 3. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In Psalm 119, Verse 118, Psalm 119, almost there. Oh, that's not the right one. Oh, sorry. Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Let me start by saying, regardless of what we're talking about, at the end of the day, what God has made us for, everything that pertains to the promises that are attached to eternal life, all center on you Knowing and growing in your knowing the Lord. Okay? Now, as I've mentioned to you many times, um, there are interesting things here in the Scriptures. There are things that are not simple. They're not, they're not uh, simplistic to handle. There are deep and complex things that have subtleties, that have many threads that weave together. And you can get lost knowing about all of those things, and then therefore completely miss why they were even given, and that is that you might know Him. Okay? So I, I want to start by saying that whatever else we may see, if we talk about um, you know, the book of the Revelation that's given at the end, uh, if we talk about you know, uh, matters that have to do with what is God doing with Israel now, like has the church replaced Israel? because Israel rejected their king. And it's a sort of all those promises are now embodied in the church in some way. Whatever it is that we might end up talking about, if we just end up talking about the stuff, we've missed the point. All of these things and their complexities, I personally think it's almost God designing it to say, you're never going to understand this if you don't come to me. It's like he's almost saying, you, you need me. The point of this is not that you might understand things. I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, the idea of theology, that's a formal study of things. And you can spend your entire life studying certain aspects of theology. Like what does, what, you can spend your entire life studying something called ecclesiology. What is the church, right? Or you can study harmatology, which is what does sin actually mean and how does God use it? And, you know, in all of that, you can come to, there are people who, are experts in um, the translation of the scriptures, why you choose these words and not these other words, and how to express it, and they don't even love Jesus. It is possible for these to be a topic. And I don't want that to be the case for us. I want each one of us to see this is actually about pursuing Jesus. I want to know him. So if you come across things that don't seem to fit together, or more likely, things that just seem to be too complicated to understand. Understand that that is a place where God is inviting you. Come. Come with me. Follow after me. Come with me. There's something that I want you to see, you to perceive. Okay? I say all of that because I'm, again, very conscious of the fact that as we study these things, as we consider these things, it's possible to just let them become topics. And that's not what God wants. He is not a topic to understand. He is a 
He is, he is life himself. And that's why I started with the passages I did. Uh, this is eternal life, that you might know God. Right? So that's what he's calling you and I to. And with that said, this passage from Psalm 118 is helpful for us. It may be something that you always have. Let me behold wonderful things from your law. Now, we might be um, distracted by that word law and immediately think of Moses' Ten Commandments only, but that word law means more than just the set of commandments and instructions. The word could also be used as instruction, as what God has said. So let me behold wonderful things from your law. Or the way I encourage each one of us, let me behold you as I handle these things. I want to know you in the midst of all these things. Okay? Last week, I talked to you about um, something called the millennium. And the fact that it has a phrase immediately tells you that it's a matter of study. It's a matter of controversy. And I just wanted to, at that point in time, introduce you to the idea. Because what I'm trying to do right now is lay down a bunch of stepping stones that at the end will make a platform for us to understand. And again, I just set these things before you. I'm very conscious of the fact that at the end of the day, uh, you have to decide yourself, this is what I believe this to say or, or not. All I can do is lay down groundwork for it and then let you take it from there. Because the reality is, I am not qualified to be the standard of truth. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I, who am I to stand before you and say, everybody else is wrong, this is what's right? Okay? And I would go further to say that the way the scriptures are written are written in such a way that uh, they're not supposed to have somebody dictate to you from the beginning, this is how you need to understand these things. Now, the, the history of the church is such that people have taken that position. Right? I, I've, I've spoken to you before about the Roman Catholic doctrine of the the church of the Pope speaking ex cathedra, right? Which is this idea that in certain matters, at certain points in time, under certain conditions, when the Pope speaks, it is the truth. He's speaking as God's representative on the earth, so you can take it to the bank. This is what is true. Okay? Now that's what, if you're a good Roman Catholic, I mean, I think most Roman Catholics don't know what a Roman Catholic actually believes. But if you are a good Roman Catholic, you accept that statement. Okay? You accept that statement. So for example, uh, one of the things that the Pope more recently spoke, recently meaning I'm talking about 70 years ago now, was, listen, this is the truth. Mary did not die. She ascended into heaven just like Jesus did. Okay? So that is an element of Roman Catholic theology. Well, how? Because the Pope has declared it, and he declared it ex cathedra. Now, on the one hand, obviously, I don't agree with that, but I'm not at the same time trying to make fun. I'm just trying to give you an example of how in our history, there have been places where people say, this is just the way it is. You've got to believe me. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I understand. At least with all the sincerity within me, I don't see how you can remove from a person the right for them to figure this out for themselves. Then it's like God wants, God wants you to pursue him in these things, but Titus will give you a shortcut. That makes no sense. Right? He is the point of all this. He is the treasure of all of these things. And um, I wanted to introduce this idea of the kingdom. One of the other things that I did more recently was I spoke with you about what a Jewish wedding looked like in the time that Jesus was speaking. And the reason why that is significant is if you don't know that, and I will say I didn't really realize a lot of that until more recently, then some of the things that Jesus said that they would have immediately understood and related to just seem strange to us, right? So as an example, the passage in John chapter 14 where Jesus said, you know, after a pretty, if, if I was Peter, I'd be quite bothered, okay? Because Peter just swore his allegiance, I'll never leave you. And Jesus says, you're going to betray me three times, okay? Before the cock is crowed, uh, twice you're going to betray me three times. And Peter's saying, oh, come on. Like, like, what would you do if that was Jesus talking to you? Okay? And the next statement that Jesus makes is, don't let your heart be troubled. So, think of it. You're Peter. You've just been told, despite your zeal and your sincerity, you're going to blow this. But 
let your heart not be troubled. Okay? In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, to them, that was immediately apparent what he was saying. He was drawing an allusion to something that happens in the Jewish process of getting married. The groom would go and prepare a place for his bride-to-be. Right? There are other places where he talks about a procession. Um, the parable of the virgins who have oil and the ones that who don't. Because they were all supposed to be waiting for the bridegroom. What are you talking about? Well, to them, that made complete sense. Right? Because one aspect of the way is once the place was ready, and the groom didn't know when that would be, that'd be up to the father, then the groom would come in a procession to go get his wife from where she was. And the instruction to the wife and her companions was, you don't know when, be ready. To them, that made sense. It wasn't like, what, like, what is this even talking about? Remember that these things were spoken to a culture people who had understandings, and part of our responsibility is to go and see what is he talking about, right? Have you noticed that Jesus never talks about texting or Facebook? He never talks about it. Why is that? Because texting doesn't actually exist? No, obviously not. But he spoke at a time painted pictures at a time that they would understand, and part of our responsibility in pursuing him is understand that. Understand that, right? OK. Um, so I wanted to set that in place. W what I'm aiming towards here is a deeper understanding of this reality. The church is not just yet another project that, the God, that God has brought about. You know, he started with Israel. They blew it. Well, now there's the church. And there is a thought amongst many Christians that the church does take over from Israel, okay? And when I say that, I want you to understand, I, no, I, I, I confess this challenge. I don't think that, but I want to be faithful in setting it before you so that you don't catch my snark as much as you catch just the truth. And again, I want you to leave it. But I am completely convinced that that's not the case. But let's just say it is the case, okay? So there are all these promises that are made to Israel, and now you believe that the church, because Jesus was rejected by the Jews, you believe that now that applies to us, okay? Well, what do you have to do for that to work? Well, there's all these very concrete promises made about Israel in the Old Testament, about this king who was coming. There uh, you know, I, I don't know, I think I gave this as homework, but I don't know if anybody did it. Go back and read the prophecies that are made about Israel in the book of Daniel. Okay, some very, very concrete, like down to numbers kind of thing that are spoken about when things were going to happen. So if it's the case that now the church has taken over because Jesus was rejected, what do you do with those promises? Well, what you have to do is turn them into something else. Okay? Somehow, either they don't apply anymore. They're just, we just drop them. They're, they're gone because they don't apply. Okay? They blew it, so all that is canceled. What does that then make you th say about what God is like if you take that approach? God did not know they were going to blow it. But they blew it, so we throw it away. Really? Then that says something about what you think about God, that he doesn't know the end from the beginning. He does, right? All of this is to say, your approach to Scripture will determine how you understand these things. If you are of the mind that Scripture is something that's symbolic, uh, it's figurative only, right? So you see all these pictures, yes, 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 there's a promise of a kingdom, but we know that that's not necessarily literally a kingdom, then you'll interpret and come to conclusions that somebody who says, no, everything that he said will come to pass, will come to pass, you will come to different conclusions. Okay? And I just wanted you to be aware, because what I'm about to say, well, as these things unfold, I'm going to set before you things that not everybody agrees with. But it is worth understanding, why do they not agree with it? And so part of that is rooted in, what is your approach to scripture? Right? Is it literal? Do we take it literal? Do we take it figurative? Do we take it literal and figurative? Right? How do we process it? Um, and it also has to do with 
understanding, therefore, things about what is the church? What is the church? So I wanted to set before you, and today we'll just t t take a little more step. The church is not merely a continuation of Israel. The church is something extraordinary that has never existed before. It wasn't a surprise in the sense of God didn't know what to do. He came up with it at the last moment, as much as it is the uncovering of a mystery. The word mystery, as it's used in the Newer Testament, is not, you can't figure this out. Okay? Like, you know how, uh, you know, if you see a mystery novel, if you read a mystery novel or a mystery movie or something like that, what does that usually mean? It means you got to kind of weave your way through and figure out what really happened at the end. But that's not how mystery is used in the New Testament. It is something that was hidden, but now has been uncovered by God, so you can see it. Okay? So, in the Older Testament, the, the, the people of God had no clue of the reality of what the church would mean. Okay? And we'll touch upon some of those things. Let me put it this way. They had no thought that a person could be a temple of the Holy Spirit. That would be blasphemous almost. Right? Temple, it's right there. What are you talking about? God dwells in there. But the Newer Testament uncovers this reality that what has happened is that you are now temples of the Holy, God, of the Holy Spirit. Okay? I give that as an example, and I will bring some scripture to show it. As, so they cannot be the same thing. It cannot be the same thing. Something has changed. And so, long story short, I, I'm going to propose that we handle Scripture as if, unless God gives reason to say this is figurative, that we take it as literal. Okay? Now, there is plenty of places where God says something, and it's clear it has to be figurative. Okay? I'll give you a classic example. At least in my mind, it's a classic example. The scriptures talk about the corners of the earth, okay? The corners of the earth. How many corners does a sphere have? None. So clearly, the earth cannot be round. Clearly. Scripture is literal, right? Well, no. So how do we understand when it's figurative, when it's not figurative? So let me just suggest to you this. First of all, when it's figurative, God will make that clear. Secondly, it has to comport with reality. Okay? What God says is true. Okay? Now, I don't mean it has to comport with what I think is reality, but it has to comport with reality. Now, we know in the time that we live, the earth is absolutely not flat. Absolutely not flat. Absolutely not flat. Okay, if there's anybody who thinks the earth is flat, please come and see me. There are people, sincere, who really believe it is flat because they really want to honor the scriptures. Okay? And then some guy on YouTube has brought up a video that shows you how it could be flat. And they come up with all sorts of conspiracies and all that. Listen, this is a mockery of being faithful to what God says. It's a mockery. God does not expect you to call black, white, east, west, night, day. He doesn't. He doesn't. So one aspect of it is it's got to comport with reality, how we see life, how we see things around here. Okay? Secondly, he himself informs things. And one of the patterns you'll find, for example, is passages that pertain to promises to Israel are timed. They're, they're tied to time, occurrences in time. So for example, in Daniel, um, he tells you that there's, there's 70 weeks, he says, appointed for your people. And as you understand that, that did obviously could not mean 77-day periods. Okay? How do we know? Well, it's been longer than 490 days since all that came to pass. But you know what? 490 years? That is significant you will find that the timing of these things came down right to the year. The promises made to the church about what is to come don't have a time stamp on it. Okay? So for example, what did Jesus tell his disciples? They asked, is it now? 
When will these things happen? Okay? And in the dialogue, you also find that you're basically told, be ready. You don't know when this is going to happen. You don't know when this is going to happen. Okay? So that gives us another instrument by which we can see, literal or figurative. But if you are of the mind that says, no, 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 and this is a significant thing in, in, the, in the history of our church that basically says, um, all that Old Testament stuff is actually symbolic now that the church is here. Okay? And we just subsume it. Well, then that's going to lead you to conclusions that make sense to you, but don't actually make sense from what I would suggest is a simpler way to handle scripture. What he says is what he says until he says, this is actually just a picture I'm painting. Okay? So very clearly, there are things that are pictures, but we should not just automatically conclude, oh, when he says it's going to happen like this, forget it. So, Case in point, and I'm still just reviewing. Last week, we talked about something called the millennium. In the book called The Revelation, in chapter 20, there is a passage that specifically says, as a result of all that's gone ahead, there's a point in time where the devil is bound. Satan is bound, okay? uh, which means that he's tied up. He has no more influence, and there's a rejoicing over heaven. And it says that for a 1,000 years, the righteous reign on earth with Jesus. Okay? And that is the millennium. The term millennium simply means 1,000 years, and it refers specifically to that. So what does that mean then? How do you understand that? Well, I would suggest it to mean that there's going to be a point in time where the devil is bound, and then Jesus and his saints rule for 1,000 years. Okay? But the vast majority of the church doesn't think that. I don't mean our church. I mean when I talk about the broader church. And you understand that... <sighs> Are you really comfortable to say anybody who's a Roman Catholic cannot be saved and cannot be a believer? I can't say that. I don't have the office to decide who is a believer and who is not. But a large part of the church, a large part of the larger body that says we name Jesus as our Lord, thinks we're already in the millennium. That the devil has been bound. When did that happen? Do you remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28? All heaven, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. Doesn't that mean the devil's been bound? And so this is a time period that we just, you know, do what he got us to do, and then eventually he's going to come and then eternity will happen. There's no thousand year. There's, the thousand year is a figure. It is a picture of a, a long time. And so their expectation for what is yet to unfold is, well, he's just going to come and it'll be the end of it. There's no, that it should not be interpreted as literal. Okay? There are other people, and this is not a small number of people either, who believe we are building that thousand years. Okay? We got to get busy and get the world the way it's supposed to be in view of Jesus' authority. We got to take over and then Jesus will come. Okay? Have you ever heard of anybody with the thought, we've got to hasten his coming? We've got to get that gospel preached to every corner of the earth because then he'll come. Right? And they don't believe that, um, again, the, your handling of that passage in Revelation chapter 20 is it becomes figurative. Okay? Jesus is already reigning. Right? He's in heaven and he's reigning. What are you talking about a thousand year reign on the earth? He's already reigning, and we are to be his hands and feet through which that reign is extended here. And it's going to get better and better and better and better. The people who have this thought have this picture of it just getting improving more. And eventually, almost all the world will believe in Jesus. And then he'll come. Okay? I would like to suggest that if we take this approach that says, Scripture is Scripture. Leave it literal until he makes it clear it's not would lead you to believe things are going to happen in such a way where Jesus is going to come and then he will reign. Okay? That's the question of the millennium. So let me now finish what, where, what I said about the church because where I want to get to is that you understand how God deals with the church is very different than how God deals with Israel. Okay? He is faithful to both. He has made promises to Israel that he will absolutely bring to pass. 
but he has made promises to the church that are also true. And if you are open to mixing the two, then I think it's harder to be faithful to the literal interpretation of Scripture than if you just take where that takes you, the, the consequence of this must be the case. So let me now go to John chapter 1. I really want to end very quickly here. Uh, let me start reading in verse 9 of John chapter 1. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay? So, before Jesus came, the revelation of the righteousness of God was through the nation of Israel. Okay? It came to the nation of Israel, right? You had to be a descendant of Abraham because God made promises, literal promises to a man named Abraham. So, you're born. How do you know whether you're a Jew or not? Well, what's your ancestry? What's your ancestry? Is your mom a Jew or not? Right? So they could trace their lineage. You know, the, 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 the tribe of Levi was given the extra special privilege of being the ones who minister to God. Okay? So, you could not grow up in Israel and say, you know what, I really want to be a priest. If you were not descended from a particular line in Levi. Okay? I grow up, my dad is a, a, you know, a scientist, and I grew up thinking, I, I really want to be a chef. Okay? Well, that kind of thing didn't come to, I really want to be a minister in the temple. Well, what's your lineage? Who you are mattered. Okay? Why? Because it had to do with what God said. It had to do with what God said. Does this mean that there were some people more precious to God than others? No, absolutely not. Okay? I remind you, the man after God's own heart could not have been a priest. I'm talking about David. Why could he not be a priest? Because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. So it, this had nothing to do with who's special and who's not special. It had to do with this is the assignment and this is how it works out. Okay, so if you wanted to be a, a part of what God was doing, it had to do with your lineage. But clearly something must have changed because now if you believe in his name, if you believe in him, if you receive him, he came to his own. They did not receive him, but to those who receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. Okay? So that is not the same as what went before. That is not the same as what went before. It isn't to say that the Jews weren't called to believe, obviously, but you were a Jew by your lineage. Your reaction to Jesus didn't decide whether you were a Jew or not. Here he says something has changed. So then he says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is very different description than the ones who belonged to God before. Very different. Okay? Let's go to another passage. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just go straight to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 19,
he's talking here in the context of uh, sexual purity, okay, morality. Because the culture that he was speaking to uh, didn't make a big deal about it, okay? And there were people being saved out of that culture by believing in Jesus. To them, he has given the right to become children of God. And they don't realize that means everything is different now. And so Paul is talking to them, and he says here, um, just for context, I'll go back. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were bought, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So you're obviously talking about how to behave, but he throws this line in that roots, anchors all of it. You're not what you used to be. You are a temple of God. Now, the idea of temple to the Jews is extremely significant. Okay? It represented God's promise, I will dwell among you. Okay? So God granted, and if you have the time or, and have never done so, go back and read about the promises, starting with the tabernacle that Moses was to build, that then became the temple. We're given insight that this is not just some random, cool-looking building. It had a template that it was following. In other words, it was a, a, a shadow of a reality in heaven that God wanted to reflect. And that becomes more apparent, especially when Jesus himself uh, comes on the scene. It wasn't just some random thing. Okay? The temple was extremely important. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, um, which is happening when Israel has been taken captive by um, Babylon, and they've been taking people out. Okay? One of the pictures that is there, and remember, that was a time of judgment because God was very angry with his people for not being faithful to him. Okay? They would worship other things. They would sacrifice their children to, to idols. Right? One of the pictures that they have is in Ezekiel is the glory of God leaving the temple. And to the Jews, that would have been devastating. Okay? It is not like, yeah, okay, so he's left, so what? This would have been devastating. They did not have a concept of a person being a temple, but by what Jesus has done, those who are part of members, uh, those who are in the church, those who put their trust in Jesus are members of his body, temples of the Holy Spirit. That was never spoken of in the older covenant, never. Do you remember David's Big fear after Bathsheba. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Do not take it from me. Because he saw what happened to Saul. But that's not who you and I are. We are a very different creature. Okay? I'll end by reminding you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So, Whatever this is that we're involved with, it's not what was going on before continued. It is a new thing that he has done. Not, I didn't know I was going to do this, but then when you rejected the king, I got to come up with plan B. This was always the plan, 
Remember, if you go back to the promise made to Abraham, in you, all the nations will be blessed. Okay, so this was rooted from the beginning. God may have chosen a nation, but his goal was always everyone. His objective was always to restore everything. Okay, it's just this is the way it unfolded. And in the wisdom of God, then Jesus, descended from Abraham, shows up. They reject him, and God's plan, then the next more glorious aspect of it is uncovered, the church. I'm going to end there. The reason why I say this is important is if you don't realize how different what you and I are from what was before, then you will be open to God treating us the same way as he treated the Jews from before. We have passed out of judgment into life, is one of the passages that it says. We are no longer objects of wrath. Now that one is a hard one for Christians who are still rooted in their performance being why God approves of them. And they haven't come to grips with, there is not a thing you could do to convince God to favor you. It has to do by believing in Jesus. You know, the, 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 the whole uncovering of this mystery that was something hidden but now is revealed that Paul goes through in Romans chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is not a statement that could have been made to those under the older covenant. And he goes on to say, you, we are passed out of judgment into life. We are no longer objects of wrath. We are the bride of Christ. So, when the time of wrath comes, will he treat us the same as what happened before? The time of wrath fell on the Jews. They've already had one taste of it. And that was a foreshadowing of things to come. But what about you and me? Well, absolutely. If we don't, if we don't, if we don't behave faithful, if we're not faithful to God, then he's going to slap us like nothing else. I understand the feelings for that. It's just not grounded in Scripture. It's just not grounded in Scripture. I don't say that he doesn't discipline his sons and daughters. He does. But there is a huge difference between discipline and wrath. Okay? And there are things coming that are specifically described as the wrath of God. This is not to talking about, do Christians get persecuted? If you're wondering about that, yes, they do. <laughs> In this world, you will have trouble. You will be persecuted if you hold fast to the Lord. And if, it, if you're not, then the question becomes, are you really holding fast to the Lord? Like, um, there was a very famous Christian who was killed during the World War II. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he described the picture. Because there were many Christians at that time, uh, and it's not unlike the time that we're in now. There were many Christians who didn't really see a problem with Nazi Germany. Okay? They, if you think that when the Nazis came to power, that everybody in, you know, was opposed to it, you'd be wrong. The idea of killing all those Jews was not an unpopular idea in Europe. It's just what happened. It was the Nazis who executed. But there were people right across Europe who thought this is what was needed all along. Okay? So, so anti-Semitism was not merely embodied in the Nazis. It was common. So I say all of this because people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer were not popular in his time. Okay? They were going against the grain. Of course, the government of the time hated him because he kept saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is evil. But there were so many people who would be Christians, by their appearance at least, who thought, well, aren't you making a big deal about nothing? And his picture was, you know, I may be misquoting this, but if you never run into, it's, it's like, you know, he painted a picture of being on a train, heading in a certain direction, and the person on the train running as fast as they can opposite to the direction of the train. What is that going to get you? 
you got to get off the train, was his picture. Right? You've got to get off the train. Or you're going along with it, even though it looks like you're running in the opposite direction. Okay? The idea was basically, I don't know who put it this way, if you never run into the devil, it could be because you're going in the same direction. Right? So if you're not being persecuted, then I'm not saying you're not a believer, but it should be a red flag saying, have I become so worldly that the devil doesn't even bother with me? Am I just happy to go along with whatever's going along? The devil has no need to bother me because the promise to the believer is you will be persecuted. And the promise to the believer is also his grace is more than enough for you. Okay? So I am not talking about we won't be persecuted, that we, we just have an easy life, that we just have a promise where everything is smooth. And, uh, I, I, that's not been my life already. <laughs> I can't imagine it's been your life that everything has gone smoothly. So when I say what I'm saying about, I don't, what I'm, let, me, let me put a name right on it, I'm talking about what's called the tribulation. Okay? I'm not there to talk about it completely yet, but what is God's reaction to the church when the time of the tribulation comes, which is labeled by Scripture as a time of wrath? Well, if you think we are a continuation of what Israel was, you'll have a different conclusion about things like the rapture than if you think that we are a different category than what went before. And what unfolds for us is going to be different than what unfolds for the promise of Israel. It has to do with how you approach scripture and how you approach the church and how you approach these promises. And my hope is as these weeks unfold, we'll lay before you this. In a nutshell, I would like to, I'll say it ahead of time and then let the controversies begin, that because of what we are, we will not go through the time of wrath. We'll be disciplined, we'll be persecuted, there's no way around that. But what is labeled as the time of wrath cannot be for us. That would be like me marrying Simona, beating her up, and then taking her home with me. The time of wrath is the time of God's punishment on the earth. If we're the bride of Christ, did he marry us to punish us and then redeem us? No, we are the redeemed. We are the redeemed. We are the redeemed. We are the redeemed. We are of something that is extraordinary. And that's why this time of grace is so important. It is now that God is saying, be reconciled. Escape from the wrath that is to come. Escape it. Be reconciled. And that's why our assignment is go and make disciples of all the nations. That starts with a person turning to the Lord, right? How did Paul and the people of his time carry out the instruction of God? Well, they got busy telling everybody and anybody, be saved. So that should be our pattern as well. Okay. Let me end there. You know, again, I'll say to you, I'm, I'm setting before you as I understand it from having looked at the scriptures. <laughs> By all means, come and take it up with me. I'm, I'm not, I don't want you to believe me because I can somehow browbeat you. Let's let the scriptures talk. And if you don't agree with me, hey, <laughs> I, I'm not bothered by that. Uh, I respect the work of Holy Spirit in your life. And wherever we are, we are drawn closer and closer to him. Okay? But I think it is important that we come to grips with this because while we live down here, if we don't have a clear idea of where all of it's heading, we'll lose track. We'll get in, in, entangled with the affairs of everyday life and forget, I'm actually here on assignment. I'm actually here on assignment. This is not my home, and it's not my goal to make this place my home. I'm here just on assignment, and he's coming for me. And when he comes, I want him to say, well done. You did what I wanted you to do. Okay? Father, again, in the name of Jesus, we just lay these things, and we lay ourselves before you. We just ask you, teach us, work with us. Every place of confusion and uncertainty because of how I've spoken, I ask you to cover and forgive. 
but take us deeper with you that we might be settled and that we might be established, that we might even more faithfully carry out our assignment now. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, when all is said and done, you are our Savior, and the privilege of our life is to be yours. So be glorified in us and through us. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.